This is Finn Voices on the Healthcare Now Radio, where we highlight and amplify the voices at the forefront of health innovation, innovation that improves people's lives. Join us for an inside look at the change makers driving conversation and answering the most important questions in healthcare today. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. This is the very first episode of Finn Voices on Healthcare Now Radio, and I'm your host, Beth Friedman. I'm senior partner at Finn, and I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. My guest today is Jonathan Wick. Jonathan is Vice President of Healthcare Insights at FinThrive. He leads the company's innovation strategy for digitizing every aspect of healthcare revenue management, the front, the middle, and the back. I actually had the pleasure of meeting Jonathan during the recent Becker's IT and Revenue Cycle Conference in Chicago. He's a national author with two books out, a speaker, and former chief revenue officer at Boulder Community Hospital. Jonathan, Thanks for being our first guest, and welcome to the show. Beth, thanks so much. I'm honored to be the first guest on the show, and I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Absolutely. So today's topic is innovation in the revenue cycle. Uh, Jonathan, I just read a survey from Bain & Company that revenue cycle is one of the top three areas for provider investment in 23. So our audience definitely wants to hear about your key takeaways from the conference and really what you see in the year ahead. Uh, but before we dive into that, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? And, you know, when you and I met in Chicago, I found it so interesting and entertaining. Um, and, you know, really what makes you so passionate about the healthcare revenue cycle? You bet. Uh, you know, I, my dad was a hospital CEO, so I always tell people that, you know, it's his fault that I'm inflicted upon the industry and the manner in which I am today. Uh, I uh, graduated with a degree in sports medicine. Um, it had aspirations of, of being a physical therapist, I think, way back when, and um, uh, saw that when I was uh, there. My dad was a, is a wise man, still still with me, and I um, said, hey, Jonathan, you really should go check that out and and uh, see if you like it, and I hated it. So <laughs> I go, now what do I do, Dad? And he goes, well, you know, maybe you should get into business, um, and also, why don't you just go work in a hospital and go see what you like or not? And uh, this was back, like, when I think, Beth, we were all in college, you know, you, you took whatever you did, so... Um, I uh, was a hospital transporter, believe it or not, making seven bucks an hour, pushing wheelchairs around. I would do that job today um, if it paid the bills. It was absolutely the most fun job I ever had, um, you know, going to the OR and ED and imaging and lab and just taking people around and talking to them about where they're from and what they're going. You were a taxi driver in a hospital, and um, it was fun. I worked my way up through um, the admissions and registrations areas, um, got a master's degree while I was there, um, and then another master's degree. Um, while I was there, I worked at night. Um, I had no life for a while. Um, got married. Um, I went to Antarctica. Did all kinds of fun things while I was at the hospital, and then um, ended up uh, working for as the director of admissions um, and registration, and uh, actually case management. Um, we had chaplains reporting to me at one point too. I I joke we prayed about our bills before they went out the door. Um, and uh, really, uh, the PFS director left one day, and they uh, created a position for me as chief revenue officer. Um, which was awesome. And so I had everything from, hi, how are you? Um, I need your your name and, and ID all the way up to, um, you don't owe us any more money and the payers paid us and thank you so much. Uh, so it's been fun. Um, I, I think that's why I'm so passionate uh, to answer your question, Beth, is um, I've seen it. Um, I worked for a payer in there as well. Um, I worked on the HIT side now with with FinThrive seven years and, and um, it's, uh, it, it healthcare for those of us that have been doing this for a while has been a rolly roller coaster of fun. I, you know, I think we're in the clicky part of the roller coaster right now. I call it where we're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and uh, my dad, I still call him once or twice a month. You know, to kind of say, hey, what do you think about this? We exchange headlines that we see, and uh, that's where we're at. As far as the books go, uh, you know, we wrote a couple books. Um, you know. As I was seeing healthcare kind of change, I wrote the first book, Patients the New Payer, because as consumers, we all owe more money with healthcare. It's not getting any cheaper last time I saw. And I talk about why that is and decisions that we, our country, and um, consumers need to start making. And I think the patient's going to be the linchpin of a lot of that. Um, and we have a lot more power than you might think as consumers um, as, as things become more transparent. And then the second book I honestly wrote out of love for the first. Everyone said, that was awesome, Jonathan, that you wrote a book. But uh, it's real easy for you to sit in your chair in your house and say, well, that's wrong. I wouldn't have done this. You wouldn't have done that. So I said, okay, fine. I'll tell you how to fix it. <laughs> so I, I wrote a book on how to get paid 
in an era of uncertainty, and that was the second book. And um, they're well received. People are using them as textbooks in their organizations and an onboarding process, and um, they're out there on Amazon and stuff. So it's been fun, but I'm happy to be here. Super, super. Yeah, so you really have seen healthcare from really every perspective. And within that, you've seen the healthcare revenue cycle from every perspective. Um, such, such an interesting journey. You know, it sounds like you and I probably did start in healthcare about the same time. So from your decades of experience, though, let's future cast a bit. So what's new in the revenue cycle and what were your key takeaways from that Becker's conference that we went to back in uh, August? Yeah, I'll start with what's new in revenue cycle. And, you know, I, I appreciate what FinThrive is doing in this space as well. We were talking about breaking the cycle of inefficiency and advancing the healthcare economy. Um, revenue cycle has became kind of this carousel. Um, I joke when I'm talking with people about, you know, the payer and the provider not really having much love between them right now. It's this Atfield and McCoy relationship. And I think, Beth, your background as a coder, um, you remember that as well in terms of if it's not the chart, it didn't happen. If the documentation's right, it's not there. We're not getting paid the right way. And um, I hear horror stories on both sides from the payer and provider about how there's data and, um, and other things that are out there in terms of, of, of what's going on and, and, and where we need to see, you know, opportunities and collaborating. So in breaking that cycle, you know, payer collaboration is something I, I think we need to really work towards and, and kind of democratizing some of that data. I think we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and also it's just, you know, you can argue with a payer all day long and play tennis. I'm not a fan of tennis. I played it when I was a kid, but you know, Hey, can I admit this patient? No, you can't. Why not? Well, because we said so. Well, what's the criteria? I don't know. Well, what do you think? And, and after a while, the ball just keeps going back and forth. And I think the industry's kind of exhausted in that. Um, from where we're at. Uh, those themes came through at Becker's um, as well. I, I kind of heard three big things go on there. Um, one, you know, where did my patients go? Um, we're seeing visit volumes at FinThrive that we measure and other things where um, lots of analyst firms out there as well. Fin, I'm, I'm sure, has seen this as well, where there's kind of been this below the surface volume that uh, is there. And, and, and we don't know um, you know, a lot of where that went. Some of it probably went to telehealth. I think, unfortunately, a, a lot of the patient volume didn't happen at all, um, which is scary to those of us that have worked in the hospitals um, as serving our communities and wondering, you know, how sick those patients were and whether they, um, uh, what, what's happened with them. And, what, and if they didn't come in, we hope and pray that something didn't go worse um, during that time. Uh, labor, uh, by far, is the number one issue impacting the industry right now. It is a crisis. I just finished a labor report. I think I shared that with you yesterday too. So listeners certainly could pick that up from either one of us, but that talks through just how this is not something that's new. I think labor has always been talked about in healthcare that we've never had enough staff and the nurses, we're going to run out of nurses and we're going to run out of coders and we're going to run out of um, frontline workers and things. Um, we've ran out of them <laughs> of about two and a half million. Um, there's a jolt survey out there that we certainly could talk about if we want, but it's a job opening labor turnover survey that has shown this bifurcation of uh, open and openings and hires. And I, the industry simply cannot hire a million and a half people in any short kind of duration. And a lot of that's clinical, but a lot of that's in revenue management as well. Um, the last thing I heard was what I kind of talked about with the payer and the tennis match. Um, folks are trying to either figure out how to outsmart the payer um, through, the, through the contracting analytics and really hold them accountable. Um, using some of the solutions that FinThrive has and others, or, you know, they're kind of reaching across the aisle, which I think is one of my favorite things to talk about is, and collaborating, going, hey, let's open up the chart and look at data together. Let's let's talk about criteria together. Let's talk about documentation together um, and do that. And um, that level of trust, I think, needs to be established between provider and payer. But uh, that's where I saw themes at Becker's, and those were front and center when I was there. So, so I heard you say three things specifically. Um, you know, patient loyalty, getting the patients back in the house, right? And then the payer provider relationship, you know, certainly I've been in healthcare long enough to know that's always an issue. Would be wonderful to see resolution of that in my lifetime for sure. And then the staffing, you know, I've heard that staffing challenge, you know, just not just in rev cycle, right? We've heard it all across the entire healthcare ecosystem. So those three are sure to be uh, top issues going into the year ahead. Just for our listeners, Jonathan, I want to make sure we're talking, we're using the word Finn quite a bit. Your company is Finn Thrive, and my company is Finn Partners, and uh, they are not related except that we do help you all with your thought leadership in the industry. But other than that, we're, we're 
purely a business relationship here, right? Um, between Finn and Finn Thrive and Absolutely. Finn Partners. Let's, let's dive a minute into um, one of the things you did mention. I, I'm curious to know how technology can help. Let's really talk about that, that labor shortage. You mentioned the labor report. You know, where, where do we see innovation in the revenue cycle kind of helping us with these staff shortages that, that I, I don't know, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's certainly pronounced in clinical. I, I, you'll hear from hospitals, and I'm sure in your travels at Finn that um, you're hearing about the premium labor that's the contract travelers that, that is, is causing a strain um, a lot. I, I think the great resignation, I hate to be cliche, but I'll say it, um, certainly caused uh, a, a lot of disruption for hospital operations. Um, they're having trouble managing their bed to patient ratios. Um, uh, left without being seen, a statistic that's measured in the ED, LBWS, um, has spiked because um, people have became impatient because there's just not enough workforce there to productively move patients through. They're also backed up and boarding in the ED, um, given those types of things. And this stuff snowballs, right? And, and, it, and revenue cycle has not been immune to it. I think specifically to answer your question from a technological standpoint, um, people didn't sign up to be on the phone with a payer for three hours. Um, they, they, you know, they signed up to you know, hospitals to kind of talk to people and help. That's why people got into healthcare. Um, and they certainly didn't sign up to do the job of three um, when there used to be there. Now there's only one or, or those types of things. So, you know, hold times, um, patient complaints, uh, billing errors, all of those things, you don't have to work in healthcare to understand it. When there's less people doing things and you don't have enough of them, the work can somehow become somewhat less stable and more diluted. And, and we're certainly seeing that at FinThrive. The market is seeing that. Um, remote work has fixed some of that. Um, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, one benefit is that you've got a national workforce to pull from. The other thing is you're competing for a national workforce. And people don't, you know, they might not want to take a second interview because, uh, you know, hey, I got a better job offer here and I can sit at home 100% of the time. They don't even want me to come in at all. Um, or uh, they don't want me to, you know, have to work on weekends, whatever that is. Providers are having to become much more uh, catering and boutique, I would offer, to retain and recruit employees um, for that matter. From a technological standpoint, what I've told revenue cycles and leaders in the business and what I've told you is you're not going to be able to, you know, recreate what you had. What COVID did, the silver lining in that is it really – uh, created an opportunity for us to pause and reevaluate and rethink and reframe how healthcare is delivered and paid for. And the last thing you want to do is pull your 2019 budget off, blow the dust off it, and go, okay, our run rate was 108 people. We're at 100. Let's post these eight positions and put them back and let's work. Um, I really would do a skill based inventory, look at upskilling. Um, I've, I've seen cross skilling as well. And then most importantly, look at automation. That example I gave you about being on the phone with a payer, there's robots today that do that through robotic process automation. There's robots out there that look for errors. And you know, let the people work on what they got into the field for, not on these mundane kind of remedial tasks that robots can handle now and, and, uh, and do that. I think if you automate instead of recreate is a term I'm starting to say these days, um, really helps your revenue cycle perform efficiently and you're not so reliant on staffing and you also insulate yourself from future staffing woes, which I don't think are going to uh, get any better in the next uh, year or so. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Finn Voices on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm Beth Friedman and I'm talking with Jonathan Wick about innovation in the healthcare revenue cycle. So you mentioned automate instead of re instead of recreate. I love that. When it comes to that, you mentioned the you know the bots through RPA that can assist with the payer provider phone calls or the tennis game back and forth. You know, what, give me give me a few other examples of some innovation, technology innovation that you're seeing in RevCycle that really is is streamlining some of those really laborious processes. Yeah, I think one of my favorites is uh, denials. And, you know, that seems to be plaguing everyone. But one of the most common denials you you get as a hospital um, is denied for clinicals, right? There's robots out there that can suspend that claim, gulp. I know you got to wait a minute and it drives a coder nuts too. You don't want that way to sit. You want it to go when it's done, but let it sit, send that message off to HIM and decoding and pull that, you know, discharge summary, soap note, whatever there is, H and P into that account, write the letter, then drop the claim. There's robots out there that can do all of that. 
index it, pull it over. Instead of, you know, picking up the phone, calling the pair and going and, you know, lobbing the first ball. Hey, did you get it? Yeah, I got it, but it doesn't have any, cl it doesn't have any clinical information. Oh, darn it. Yeah, that's right. I'll call you back tomorrow. Lob back. Here it is. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Um, there's ways to automate that to where, you know, for specific pairs, they need specific things. And frankly, I think there's no excuse for some of that stuff these days. Um, I worked for a pair. If the pair wants it, they're not going to change their mind anytime soon, other than maybe asking for more stuff. So you might as well get a baseline that automates those things to where you're getting credit for what you're doing. And um, that's one of my favorite use cases. We have others if we want to talk about them, but that's one of my, my favorites. Yeah, that prepare provider relationship, it's just always been a, a point of friction and difficulty. So looking ahead to 23, you know, I've heard about some regulatory changes maybe on the horizon. Of course, there's always that debate about what will happen with the public health emergency wind down. So, you know, I know that as healthcare providers, our audience has got to start thinking about that in the revenue cycle and preparing for that. So what's coming, what's, what's coming at us, if you will, from Washington that we might need to keep an eye on? Right. I just presented to my business today um, on, uh, you know, legislative stuff. You know, first and foremost, I'm not sure when we're going to publish, you know, some of this podcast and when you're hearing it, but it's going to be around an election. And so um, go vote if you haven't. And if you did, thank you. Um, and, and when we're doing those things, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, where those votes have an impact in terms of uh, legislation. Um, some of the things that I researched and, and looked at, I'm kind of a a legislative nerd is, you know, who's running the committees and what's going on? Who's on the health committee? Who's on the ways and means committee? Who's on the committee finance subcommittee on health care? Those types of things. A lot of the laws that we're dealing with today came out of those committees. Um, and so depending on the political valence, and I'll call it that to be neutral, um, the expertise um, that is there as well. Um, I love having physicians in Congress as an example. I think that's a great Great addition. Um, docs actually know medicine quite well. Um, they went to school for it. <laughs> and I, I, I like it when they're involved in legislation from where they're at. Um, uh, they may not have had much to do with things like the No Surprises Act and the Transparency Bill, for example. Or maybe they did. I don't know. I doubt it, though, because they don't look like they're written by docs. Um, but those are some of the big things. I think No Surprises Act is one of the most fundamental and, and probably macro pieces of legislation we've seen since the ACA, and I, I mean that wholeheartedly, very, very complicated piece of legislation that touches a lot of patients. Um, and it's going to help, I think, first and foremost, with just, you know, insulating consumers from surprise bills. That's first and foremost um, on there. But there's some other kind of runouts with that surrounding convening, conveying providers, um, putting some obligations on hospitals to say, you know, hey, Beth, you're coming in here for a hysterectomy, and um, the anesthesiologist is at networks. We've got to reach out to them and find out what their PACU charges are so that we can show you a bill that is everything, um, not just our facility charges. That is very difficult for a hospital to figure out, especially if they've got rotating traveling contracts with anesthesiologists, if you're going to different clinics, um, pathologists. Um, uh, 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 certainly imaging, a radiologist, those types of areas all have moving parts with that. And hospitals are going to be put in the unfortunate position of being kind of the hub if they're the car wash, I like to call it. If the car's going through it, they got to know where the soap and the water and the rags are all coming from so that what kind of money gets put in the slot before they come through. I know that's an awful example, but really the No Surprises Act is for when an out-of-network car comes through the car wash. <laughs> you know, are you going to get the purple and yellow and green foam, um, you know, from some someone, and is that a third-party contractor, and that foam actually costs more, and do you, are you pushing the deluxe button or the or the standard kind of run-through button? Really horrible example, but that's one. Um, the transparency bill for payers has also got some interesting run out, too. They've got to put something together called an AEOB, an Advanced Explanation of Benefits. Um, they've had that for some time, and if you've worked at a pair like I have, you know that they've had a portal for estimates. It's this wonderful place that no member has ever gone, I like to say. <laughs> Log on to the pair and, um, and, and say, hey, how much is it going to cost me for my hysterectomy or for my hip replacement? Um, you don't have a relationship, Beth. You know that with your pair. You have a relationship with your obstetrician or your doctor or the hospital, and you call and ask them. So again, the government's got a great idea, but it's kind of misaligned. Like people don't call payers, but, but they might now that this rule's there. But that AOB's got to be re reduced in one day. 
Um, and most payers don't want to turn things around that quickly because whenever a payer turns anything around, they're held to it, right? So if they say, this is what it's going to be paid, and I calculated the wrong type of soap back in the example I gave you, they're on the hook for it, as is the provider. And that's why we've seen such hesitancy. So those two things are really big ones. Um, depending on how Congress ends up, you know, I think we're going to end up with a split Congress, but we'll find out here in a week. Um, if, if that ends up, we'll have a lot of gridlock, um, which is great for the stock market, I think, but not so great for healthcare reform. Um, so we'll figure out like that. But, I, you know, I think if things stay the same um, and the Democrats continue to, to, to run Congress, um, you'll see continued support and uh, buttressing of the ACA, Medicaid expansion, those things. I think if, uh, if we see a split Congress, things might get stuck if it swings all the way um, and, and the Republicans gain control of both. Um, we might see some dismantling again of Medicaid, maybe some more waivers um, to kind of restrict whose enrollment and, and where we're at, um, maybe a little less support for hospitals in terms of funding without some scrutiny, that type of stuff. Unfortunately, Beth, I'll end here. There is not a lot of partisan stuff that's out there other than drugs, transparency, and maybe some of the kind of COVID preparedness stuff. But most we're pretty polarized as a country right now. Um, and so anything legislatively and regulatorily might get stuck here in the next couple of days, I think, based off where we may end up in Congress. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I did. So, so a little bit of wait and see. And I yeah. also um, I also learned, which is rare for me, a new healthcare acronym, AEOB. That was a new one for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks yeah, for sharing. Those are, EOBs have been there for a while, but adding that A to the front adds it makes yeah, more Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So we talked about, let's say we talked about getting the patients back in the door. We didn't really talk too much about that financial experience. Maybe we'll, we'll save that for next time. We talked about applying some technology and automation to some of the staffing challenges. Uh, and then we also talked about sort of that payer provider relationship and maybe how technology can make um, that conversation a little bit easier, at least automate a bits of that conversation that that now take a lot of that tennis game back and forth and, and, and phone tag and things like that. Um, so, you know, all hot topics in revenue management and, you know, Jonathan, I really see all key areas for innovation here. You know, before we, uh, before we wrap out the show, any last thoughts, any final thoughts for our listeners and particularly for our listeners that, that are involved in revenue cycle management at uh, a healthcare provider site? Yeah, I think um, as you look at you know where we're at, I, I don't think anybody would have created the healthcare system that is the U.S. healthcare system now. So yeah, let's get like seven different people with nine different goals and have them all fight over how you're gonna get paid. <laughs> and oh by the way, let's put some government, let's sprinkle some government regulation on top just to make it spicy. I don't think anybody wanted that. I, I, and so I, I think it's important as you look at healthcare, really rethinking and re and re framing what you're going to do. Um, and we talked about it today. I think you got to address labor in a different way. You can't just keep throwing bodies at things. You've got to automate. Um, you got to look at those automation and engineering things that are out there. RPA was kind of the spooky thing that no one knew about. Um, it actually, there are use cases that we talked about where you can automate some of these tasks and that has a double benefit. One, you're doing things better, faster, quicker. Two, people are happier when they're at work and they might stay because they're not working on stuff they don't want to work on right? The third really is the patient, and nothing happens without the patient. You and I have both worked in a hospital. You know that. If they aren't coming back and they got lots of choices now, they're going to vote with their legs. So you've got to provide a frictionless, transparent, and awesome, awesome, awesome experience for them to where they're telling their friends just like they tell a great restaurant. Hey, I went to Cook County, or I went to Bell South, or I went to, you know, Banner Health, and that was awesome. And they did this, this, and this, and this, and no matter how well you save a life, deliver a baby, put a new hip in, if the billing and the coding and all of that stuff isn't orchestrated in an elegant way, it's going to end up with a bad review. And patients are the new payer, and they're going to tell you about it. Um, people can get a hold of me, at, uh, you know, just by Googling me. It's, it's two I's and a K. You can find me that way, jonathan.wick at finthrive.com. I've got some books out on Amazon as well, but um, that's how folks can find me, Beth, and it was fun. Yeah, it was funny. I really appreciate the talk that you touched briefly on that patient experience. And, you know, there's a big component of the financial experience, too, there. Um, you know, I always think that patient financial experience 
we're at both the very beginning and the very end of that patient journey, right? When the patient just finds out they need a procedure or they need a test. So RevCycle does that patient access part, right? And then we're at the very end when they're not sure how to pay the bill. <laughs> We've got patient financial touch points across that entire journey. Hey, Jonathan, I just want to thank you so very much for being on the show today. Uh, very honored to have you as our very first guest as well on Fin Voices, part of Healthcare Now Radio. And um, we look forward to talking again soon. You bet. Thanks, Beth, for having me. I appreciate it. And that's a wrap for today's broadcast. We want to thank our listeners for tuning in and our guest, Jonathan Wick, VP of Healthcare Insights at FenThrive. For more information or to follow Jonathan's work at FenThrive, go to the company's website, FenThrive.com, or follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter at JonathanWick1 or at FenThrive. Thank you again for tuning in. Until next time and all in health, this is Beth Friedman at Fen Partners. Fin Voices is brought to you by Fin Partners, a global marketing and communications agency working across industries and services. Whether inside our walls or on the front lines of health transformation, we stand together to create meaningful and measurable impact in the world around us. Learn more at finpartners.com and follow us on Twitter at Fin Partners.